September the 15th, 2007. Newcomers should always check into cuttingthroughthematrix.com for lots of downloadable material on the histories of this old world of ours. It's seen so much chaos, and we're going through the next phase of chaos as they bring out the new age. And they can also download transcripts in the tongues of Europe at alanwattsentinel.eu. Now, for those who suddenly wake up because they've been personally affected by the changes that are occurring more rapidly today, mainly in the pocketbook or the loser jobs and plants close down, or the competition buys out their company and, and throws them on the street. Uh, the workers generally don't know what's really going on, and they're told by the mainstream media uh, that they shouldn't look for a job for life. It's been going on for about 20 years now. When they started this hype, you'll have maybe 10, 15 jobs in your lifetime, and you're supposed to just get used to it. And the ground in circles looking for answers, and those who manage to get back into companies and businesses and corporations stop right there once they get employed again they're back into the rat race they're, they're, they're shuffling hard for money and they're hustling away to keep afloat and to keep their mortgages going or their rents going or families going and it's not an easy task so therefore it's easy for them when they start to wake up to fall into the other trap which has been laid out by the same big boys who run the world and that's the trap of thinking that somehow Somehow, it can't be human beings that run this world. It must be something alien to them. And that comes quite naturally because, you see, you've already swallowed the world as it's been presented to you. And the thought, the thought that it could be people who are so well-connected and organized that run the world, so incredibly detailed in their mythology, is a hard thing to grasp, so it's either to jump off into the paranormal or into aliens or whatever around and accept the basic truth. And part of the reason for that is because we've been given a complete fake history, a fake reality, in fact. And it's so easy then to jump into what must be something else, because I'm so clever, how could I have been fooled my whole life? So you fall into the trap of it must be something other than human. In a sense, it is, and it is psychopathic in structure, and that can be verified if you want to look into uh, the pathologies of psycho psychopathy. It's not hard to find, and you find these people crave power all down through the ages. Now, they give us the old histories of ancient tyrants, and the most recent one we're always given is Adolf Hitler, but there's been many more since even Hitler, and they're born in every generation, and they're born mainly in the powerful families, at least the ones we see who emerge, the ones who are lucky enough to be born into these wealthy, powerful families, they took, take over from their parents and they become dynasties, as we see in politics, especially in the U.S. In Britain, they're more careful to hide their names, often taking the maiden name for the males even. But they're, they're dynasties that run the world, and they run it through institutions, institutions that go up in a, a pyramid-type structure until you have the big boys at the top and the royal families even of Europe and beneath them you have this Royal Institute of International Affairs which claims, it claims, even though it's a royal charter to exist as a, an institution and it's a legal term, institution like a public institution it's kind of there to serve a purpose for the public but not on behalf of the public it's chartered by royalty and they have, they're, they're the guys who set up the League of Nations, and then they set up the United Nations. And their goal has always been a world system, a global system, based on the one system that stemmed from the elite of, say, London, England, for instance. And they'll stand for no other culture standing in their way, no ulterior alternative. Uh, methods or cultures will be allowed to coexist with them. A standardization process, if you like. And from there, they set up the, uh, the Council for Pacific Relations. That was a branch that has dealt for about 70 years uh, with the Far East in Australia and New Zealand. And their job was to bring in that group 
under a big trading block for the future, which is here now, and they set up the Council on Foreign Relations, the American branch, that deals mainly with the Americas. And they're bringing everything together. Now, people should look into the, their own website, to the Royal Institute of International Affairs, and you'll see they also have members-only pages where they get to, uh, they give a, a public description of themselves, but they have a membership-only um, column there as well because those who are, have memberships have their own passwords and they get in to their, the, the different um, m all multifarious sites they have, incredible amount of sites that they have, and the, all the organizations that run off of them, that's the tree of life, you might say, because it's got branches going into every facet of society. And this was started up officially, that is, by the combination of the Road Foundation, Cecil Rhodes, was given a charter to start up his own little private, almost the black water of his day, a private sort of organization would take over a good part of Africa, especially the, the mineral rights, the gold and diamond rights of it, to accumulate the wealth, but also to start wars and get to the Boers, the, the, the Dutch, out of South Africa. And they did it by staging a raid on the Boers' settlements, claiming it would happen the other way around. They even employed a, a woman reporter, who told the British people that the Boers had attacked the British. So what could Britain do, poor soul? They had to go and defend English settlers, and that's how the Boer War started. It was started by a private company doing a raid into South Africa and then employing reporters to lie to the British public and giving the British government an excuse to do what they always wanted to do in the first place. And that's how history is made, you see. And that's official, that's now declared, it's, it's an open in the, the, the even more modern history books. But they eventually merged with the Lord Alfred Milner Round Table Society, another uh, high elite organization made up of aristocracy. And they became the Royal Institute of International Affairs with the goal of creating a system of free trade. But not just free trade, it sounds so wonderful, free trade. But really, it was to limit trade. It was for big corporations, which they would found themselves, remembering that Britain was a premier organization for actually founding world corporations, beginning with the British East India Company. That was all funded by the royal families of Europe, and the shareholders were also the same people. Ordinary people couldn't get, get shares in it at all. And they ran the opium trades and all the other nefarious types of drug trades, which they comically called spices, the spice wars. So uh, their goal then was to bring in a British-type system, and they created what they also called the Anglo-American Establishment. A very good book was put out by Professor Carl Quigley on this topic and the connections to interrelated families of both Britain and the United States with this particular goal in mind of world government and how they, through corporations and foundations working in tandem, would eventually control the world using this London-based system uh, as, an as the foundation, this type of culture that exists within the elite of the aristocracy. And they've been behind wars from the very beginning, as I say, the first war they had, they started off the Boer War, and they take credit for that too. They were the ones who started it with this private little group of Cecil Rhodes. That's how wars have started, and that's how you get the desired effect, which is really to, to get a synthesis, because out of every war and conflict, you have treaties made where the victor generally takes the spoils, but you always find too, and this is known in sociology and in uh, political science, the high bureaucracy of the defeated side, because it lives so well and so high on the hog generally, merge with the bureaucracies of, of the victors, and they become one. And that's happened all the way back to ancient Egypt even. The same thing happened with invading armies in Egypt, and you always found after about 20 years or even less, uh, the, the bureaucracies of the invading armies, their governmental type system structure would merge with the Egyptians and it all become one. And they grow and create a bigger empire from that union. It didn't matter who won and who lost because amongst the elite they, they never lose, you see. And often 
you find they're related anyway, first cousins and sometimes even brothers. The history of England alone will prove that point. And you find from Queen Elizabeth I court onwards, they were more open with an agenda. We tend to look at the Middle Ages and think they were pretty backwards and, and living so primitively, and nothing can be further from the truth for the wealthy elite. They lived very, very well. Um, even to, by today's standards, they lived at a much higher than standard than the average person can imagine. Going back to ancient Rome, don't forget they had undergrounds uh, water, uh, hot water to, for central heating, going around their big palaces. You go back even further into the Minoan society, and we know that from little islands that are left from a huge island that's sunk in the Aegean Sea, where Terra is now. Terra, with all of its frescoes and its wonderful uh, living in the Azure Seas, had uh, we had uh, plumbing, plumbing to all the different uh, houses that were built in it, plumbing, hot water as well. So they lived very well indeed. And you go back even further to the Harpian civilization that was the precursor of Sumer. And my goodness, you find those guys, rich, rich merchants too, that ran much ancient, more ancient trade routes all the way from the Middle East right through to China, also had indoor showers. Well, indoor showers, eh? And we think they're so modern. I bet they paid a lot less for it then as they do today. So... So in the Middle Ages, going back to Queen Elizabeth I court, they were much more open with their agenda when they declared it would be a British or British, B-R-Y-tish empire. That's what they called it. And John Dee was the man who proposed it to Queen Elizabeth I. And it would be based on free trade. And those countries that would adopt the British system would be eventually called a commonwealth because you held the wealth of the commoners, the commonwealth, you see. And... At the same time, if they would adopt the same parliamentary-type system of aristocracy running over with a House of Lords and all the rest of it, then they would be given a, a form of most favoured nations, a trading status. And that's what China was given just recently. So nothing changes. 100-year-old uh, plans are nothing at all. 400-year-old plans are nothing at all to fulfil if you have the foundations and as Carl quickly said, foundations exist and last longer than any single person. They employ, as they retire uh, older members, they employ new members, and they take over with the agenda and the mandate, and they can fulfill whatever they project in the future. And that's how they pull all of this off, is by planning a careful selection of their members and unlimited wealth to hire think tanks for these institutions to make sure that they can plan a future, look at all the reactions from the public in that future, and even set up leaders to sway the public off in a different direction. And that's all before they've made the first move on the chessboard. So you plan everything like a strategy and war way ahead of time, and then gradually you, you pull it off. And for those who wake up, they're suddenly stunned because they have no idea. They think that democracy really exists. They really do. They really think there's been such a thing as democracy, which has been the, the main front cover for this whole agenda all of this time. And then they find out suddenly, you no, know, all these institutions that they're given for the public uh, really don't work, or they're not there at all, or there's no real justice. So they go off into outer space thinking it must be aliens, and that's why big boys are funded uh, by the futurist society to put that idea in your mind. And then you run around in circles for the rest of your life, buying lots and lots of books and talking about Zeta Reticuli and visiting channelers and all this rubbish. And you become very, very poor, very confused, very confused indeed. And you'll never get anywhere near the truth. You're in la-la land. The New Age movement was also created by the big foundations. Look into the histories, for instance, of Madame Blavatsky, who was the kickoff a form of Freemasonry, even though Pike and Mackay, who was a historian for Freemasonry, uh, said these were side uh, degrees. They're not real true degrees because they only give men the high degrees. But it was to fool women into joining this, what they thought was an occult mystic organization, because they had to get the, the middle class uh, female population on board, so they gave them what they called theosophy. And Blavatsky was put out there as the founder. She was primarily an actress. Her 
sister herself wrote a book about it saying she'd been acting since she was a child and telling stories. And she did her job very well. And she was getting backing by the media that was also owned by the same aristocracy that pushed her. You always give religions for the public. You give mysticism to the public and you keep them mystified forever. And the best way of discrediting true information, which is called intelligence, is to grab that same intelligence, mix it with fantasy, and offer it to the public, who will often run with it. And those who are still given out the basic intelligence are then poo-pooed by people who've heard all the nonsense. I'll be back with more after the following messages. Hi. I'm on walk back with Cutting Through the Matrix and just taking some of the veils away to show you how very, very wealthy people who run the managed system of the world, the, the trick is to get the public to believe what wealth is. They, they say this is wealth and so you believe it and you use it for currency. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter if it's baked beans or porcupine quills as long as the public believe that's what wealth is. And those who have control over uh, the source of that wealth, which is generally used to be the gold and silver industry in, for the Western countries in the Middle East, it doesn't matter if it's that or the printing presses, as long as they say so, then they are in charge of the wealth. Therefore, they can churn as much out as they want to hire thousands of think tanks in all areas of control. And that's the key to it, is the areas of control. And it's not difficult to look into how societies have been controlled all down through the ages because religion stands at the top. Now, if you want to take over a world, you must take charge of all the religions at the top as well. And you take over those religions and put your own people in or buy them off. And greed uh, isn't restricted to any particular faith. So it's quite easy to take people over and even insert them in. And after a generation or two, you'll, you'll think that they're yours, like the Queen of England isn't really the top. She's the, the kind of pope of the Anglican Church for England. And all the, the way back since Henry VIII, that's when it started, when he took over that role. And she sits at the head of the Anglican Church and puts this, puts this little um, archbishop on top of the rest of the public. But she's still the head of it. And so she rules uh, in the place of God, you see. And that was always called the divine right of kings. King James I got in a bit of trouble over that because he, he wrote a big treatise on his right to rule, uh, speaking for God, and how no one had the right, and how dare they, in fact, question his decisions because he spoke as God, basically. And that's not too long ago, but nothing much has really changed. If you were at the top of the world and you have command over millions and millions of people, such as the British Commonwealth, and it seems America's also roped in there because so many of the top politicians have gone on uh, over the years to get knighted by the Queen. And uh, that was again forbidden by the Constitution, but it doesn't matter anymore. It's kind of out the window, as we can see. And they go over to get knighted for a top honour. And even top mafia guys wanted to be knighted. You find the Bronfmans, old Sam Bronfman, that ran the whiskey trade and the cocaine trade during the Roaring Twenties and Prohibition. Uh, his, his dying wish was, was to be knighted by the Queen of England. An odd thing for a gangster, isn't it? Until you realize that the same group at the top run the legal world for the public to see. And when they can't use that system because the public would complain, they use the underground, the, the underworld, you see, to do it for them. That's how it works. But getting back to theosophy that was created mainly for, for women to get them in to the occult organizations. And they wanted really a middle class and the upper middle class to come in and get them on board, as you say, which pirates love, then you find that Annie Besant took over from Blavatsky. And so you had an HB for Helena Blavatsky, and then you had an AB for Annie Besant, and she was followed by another AB, which was Alice Bailey. But, but you go back to Besant. Now, why on earth would you have a name like Besant? Names are very important for front people because Besant was the name the Knights Templar gave to the flag, you see. That's why. And her, her father was a Lord Bruce Besant in the 
in the British House of Lords. Again, aristocracy was in charge of the setting up of that movement to get them in. And sure enough, the women went into it and thought they were being told secrets, but then were told what the great work was for them, at least. And that was, again, to, to encourage uh, missionary work across the world, not going themselves, mind you, but to encourage others to do it, you know, the lower middle class, to go off abroad and uh, suffer the hardships and convert all these poor pagans that just need God's help so that the British could steal their land and property and all their wealth. And that's what they did uh, for a few, a couple of centuries. So you, you, you find that money rules, as they say, money rules everything only because the public accept it as a, a substitute for something or other. In other words, real wealth. And that's why they call real estate the only real estate. That's why it's called real estate. Everything else is fake, you see. And even your real estate isn't yours, your property, because if you look at uh, even your titles to your deed, you'll find really that you don't own it at all. Then it's registered. Anything that's registered under law is not yours anymore. You're simply in possession of it. Uh, so we're conned and conned and conned all down the, 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 this, this long, dusty road. And going back to the Royal Institute of International Affairs, they have publicly taken the credit for pushing and putting the bills forward for the income tax and property tax quite some time ago. They were the ones who did it. The CFR branch did the same thing in the United States. So they've been running this world as a sort of front organization for this aristocracy, this very old aristocracy that's run the world for a long, long time, that actually uses for its symbols all the symbols of Egypt even. And that's an odd thing to say, but it's true because the coronation of the queen can show you sitting in, on a raised diaz or a, a ziggurat-type pyramid, a stepped pyramid in the throne, wearing a crown and holding the little scepter, which is the world, and the little little wand thing in her hand, which is actually a little flail. And you'll see the same thing in ancient pharaohs as well. And you'll see it on the, 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 the hieroglyphs, even depicting Nimrod. Thousands of years ago, and there it has been performed in Britain, in places like Westminster Abbey. And you find the floor of Westminster Abbey, it's a checkerboard floor, the black and white squares, which is also the tesserated floor of the Masonic Lodge. And in Westminster Abbey too, if you walk around there and look at all these knights, they're put in little sarcophagi, just like the tombs of Egypt. And on one wall, they have one for a very wealthy old family from Norman descent. And they have two Egyptian obelisks on the ground floor. And just halfway up the wall is another two there, very obvious Egyptian obelisks in a supposedly Christian church from the Middle Ages. And people go through that and never, ever question why, because... We're not taught to think or reason. We're taught to, to parrot what we're told. And that gets me back to my original point here. The sudden shock of waking up and realizing that things are not the way it's been downloaded into your mind to be. Things are vastly different. Today we see the velvet glove being taken off the iron fist, which is showing itself and is glistening rather, rather brightly in all countries under this terrorism act. Britain has now declared itself to be in the newspapers, Fortress Britain. They copied that from the one that was in the Canadian papers from 2005, when the Prime Minister of Canada signed an agreement with Mexico and Canada to basically integrate the first open part that was given to the public on national television for the integration of the Americas, security forces, taxation systems, customs duties, all that was pretty integrated and they had to make a, another um, another five up until five agreements up until 2010 and by then the complete uh, unification of at least the US, Canada and Mexico and perhaps even Chile was to be completed and up and running and before that they even discussed putting a new capital for the Americas and new Brussels, just like Europe's got and base it in Montreal, Canada. Why Montreal? Because it's under the Napoleonic Code, which was rather likely on the banking system, and that's where they'll be based. So we're, we're going through a script. That's the bottom line. We live a script. And just giving you a little bit, a little bit, because there's so much, so much you could give out, but it would take forever. It's 
showing you how nothing has been left, no stone has been left unturned to bring about a totally controlled society. Now, in ancient times, even in Egypt, who left more records than most nations about their method of control, they simply dominated the public by giving them a particular religion with the Eye of Ra. And you couldn't go anywhere in Egypt without seeing a symbol of the Eye of Ra. And in other words, this eye was watching you and knew your thoughts, you see, you could see inside your mind, and you had to behave yourself. And even the slaves were trained that this eye, no matter where they ran off to, uh, they get found. And so they were the, the best behaved slave that ever existed. They found the same technique with tyrants down through history. And even Stalin had his picture everywhere, just like Orwell, George Orwell showed in his 1984 black and white movie made in 1984 by the, a British company with Richard Burton in the movie. And wherever you went, even up your stairwell, you see pictures of the tyrant who was watching you, this fatherly figure, this stern fatherly figure. And that was meant to, to implant itself in your mind that, that there was nothing that you did that wasn't known. So that's the key to it all. If you can either make people believe religion and keep them very ignorant, and the masses in all ages, remember, could even read and write. We were only given reading and writing for the majority of the public to, so that we be efficient in industry. You can't very well make things in factories if you can't follow instructions and read blueprints, so they have to give a basic education. But they also withheld archives of history, the true archives of history. All you got at school was dates, times, battles, and, and winners. That's what you got. You weren't given the primary motivating forces behind it all and who benefited from it and who funded it. And that's the main thing. Who funds all these wars? You'll find that you pay for it all, but you, you seldom find really, except maybe a hundred years after the event, who actually funded it and profited it from the first place. And by the way, why isn't there a world court to... to to try these characters for crimes against humanity, all these big bankers that fund the wars. I mean, wouldn't that be a start in the right direction? Because without their funding, you see, they wouldn't have the wars. That's too obvious. That'll never happen. And that has been run down through the ages. So Joe Blow is waking up today, and he's freaking out because he says, my God, this system that I thought was mine is vanishing. And I see all these armored vehicles around big cities and so on and now they're going to go into searching people in shopping malls as you walk into the shopping mall or the shopping plaza they want to do body searches there now because now you've had a few years of seeing these black clad goons with machine guns walking around in these shopping malls and subway stations well now they want to search everybody coming in and out you see training you Pavlovian style step by step and that's how they do it with animals all those animal things that you watched on television and experiment with animals, it was nothing to do with the animal behavior control. It was all to be used on you. And once you become familiar with something in your environment, that's the key to it. That's what Singer talked about in behaviorism, the psychology of behaviorism and how to con control millions of people. You, can, you alter the person's behavior by altering their environment. Once you accept a foreign object in your environment, and a guy with a black uniform on and a machine gun is definitely a foreign object in your environment, then the next step is to get you padded down and you'll accept that. So it's always a step-by-step-by-step -step -step process of acceptance in this Pavlovian style because we're going into an era where the changes they're making are so so contrary to everything that you thought was normal, even though normal was given to you as well, because normal keeps changing, it's so contrary to it uh, that, it, it, again, it seems an alien to you, completely alien, uh, all of this, this kind of uh, behavior, plus even bringing in the DNA testing on babies and such like that, which is going on in Michigan or Illinois and other places. This, this is the, the whole eugenics system being pushed into play step by step. And eventually, and not too long from now, what's left of marriage will be forbidden, except for a little while amongst people who are allowed to marry for certain offspring's purposes only. That will be the thing. And then eventually we'll go into the enhanced humans and there'll be two classes of human beings. This has all been written about and, and published in the mainstream and unfortunately, people only, only believe the mainstream. 
but they have published that with two classes of people, the genetically enhanced ones who will be superior and the inferior types, you know, the, the junk gene types. At the moment, we're all the junk gene types, all the commoners, if you don't have a title, because the elite go by the Darwinian theory, and Darwin is only a front man for those particular people. They believe that they have proven by accumulating vast amounts of wealth and power over billions of people across the world that they have the right to rule those people, that they are superior. And even though we can classify them as psychopathic in nature, which they definitely are, they don't class themselves the same way. They, don't, they see that as the natural process of nature. The top predators have the right to dominate the weaker ones. That's what they believe. And we're going through this new, brave new world scenario and this hundred years war, and that's what it was called by Rumsfeld himself, this hundred years war. Obviously, it's not going to take a hundred years to alter the Middle East. We know that. We know that for a fact. So they're talking about the whole world system and bringing in this new scientific type of dictatorship where technocrats and scientists will dominate the process of of the future and the kind of world you're going to get brought up in, in, into. And they'll also be a world run by experts. It pretty well is already. It's a world run by experts. And that's what Lord Bertrand Russell wrote about back in the 1920s and then again in the 50s with his book, The Impact of Science on Society. He said, we shall create a world where the average person will be unable to think for themselves. We shall give them experts for everything. And he was talking about using the media, television and radio primarily. Until you grow up, one generation grows up with that. And sure enough, they can't go outside without listening to the weatherman to tell them what to put on and what to wear that day. That's how bad it's become. The example Russell gave was that a mother would be unable to change the diaper on her own child without professional instruction from an expert. And here we are. We've been here for millions of years, supposedly, and women had no problem with that in the past. But today, they don't know. They don't know. And they have no confidence because an expert must tell you what to do. And that's already happened. And it's happened with pretty well every facet of our lives. Now, at the top of this multifarious octopus with even more legs going off it than the octopus's eight, going into thousands and thousands of branches, they also gave you the self-help groups. And vast amounts of bookshelf space has been given in all your public libraries and in all of their, your mainstream bookstores for self-help books. It's incredible how many there are out there. For every problem, there's, a self, there's, there's dozens of often conflicting self-help books because all of this was to get you into a form of throwing out your old crutches, which generally was religion, you see, for people, and accepting scientific crutches because the scientific ones that use a bit of psychobabble uh, to, to, to hook you um, will we'll take over, the white-coated priests take over from the black-coated priests, and you think they're professional and scientific, so you follow their advice. And that's created incredible chaos throughout society, especially amongst families. And people actually read these books, and then they go out and start arguing with their mate or someone else, where they say, well, you've been oppressing me all my life. It says so in this book here, see? And I've got to do this about it. This has been happening. These were all put out by the different legs of this big octopus, this Royal Institute for International Affairs, that's in league with all the other foundations, especially the scientific foundations and all data-gathering foundations because knowledge is power. And those who have ultimate knowledge have ultimate power over all the rest. And this is how the world really is run. It's an integrated system of power that interrelates and interlocks with each other. And they have annual meetings with specific parts of their, of their functions going together, like the Bilderberger Group, where royal families and big bankers and up-and-coming prime ministers or presidents are brought in. And that's where they select the presidents, in fact, before you ever hear their names and try to dispel some of the, the modern myths that are being put out there, again, heavily funded to confuse people and keep them going in circles and by that I mean also the whole New Age movement which was started and promoted out of London once again 
that they were the ones who started the whole idea of mediumship or channeling, as they called it then. And that flourished through people like Madame Blavatsky and through a lot of the, the women's circles, the upper middle classes and so on, as they had little tea meetings, tea and crumpets, as they called it. And they did invite in the local channeler who would give them what everyone really wants in that whole movement, regardless of the, the type that they go into. They want a form of assurance that for them personally, personally, the world's going to be okay and the future is going to be just nice and hunky-dory, regardless of what's happening to anyone else. That's really what all these characters prey on. They prey on the fears of the individual. And sometimes, sure, they'll tell you you'll meet someone tall, dark, and handsome. And that's no lie, because in your life, you have no doubt you'll meet them here and there. It doesn't mean anything is going to happen, but you'll meet them. But people are really after assurance, which is a form of insurance that they're going to be all right. In the old days, you'd just pay priests for that thing. They'd pray to their deity, and you'd be blessed, and you felt protected. And the more afraid you were and the more money you had, you could feel much, much better after parting with your money. And having all these prayers said for you, you had special protection. And it's much the same. The more they pay to the sharks out there for their well-being in the future, the better they feel. They must live in this delusion, not just illusion, but delusion that somehow uh, forces are going to take care of them personally as the world goes to hell in a handbasket. And other ones use different techniques too. Uh, pictures which are, as Carl Jung called them, he said they're archetypal images. And you'll find that on, on various symbols and in cards and so on. And they use that too to, to give you readings and, and soak the money out of you and give you that good news and maybe a little cautious news just to make it sound more real. And they fleece you because you're the sheep, you see, and that's what you do with sheep. You fleece the sheep. And they're all mutts. They're mutton, you see. That's the function of a sheep. And the good shepherds that come out from the top to lead the people who have no faith in themselves uh, love to follow the good shepherds. So they always get fleeced. That's the history of the world. And it's still going on today. And as I say, this whole New Age movement was designed also to bring in a new type of religion, a religion where people will be disconnected with their reality, regardless of what's happening in the world or to those around them. They live in their own little world, and, and the, the, the way of their hands to bring down the moon and Wicca and all this kind of stuff, and feel very, very nice as people across the world are being blown to bits by their tax money in the forms of bombs and cluster bombs, etc. So they're oblivious to what's happening in politics. They don't want to know. And that's how you disarm people. You disarm their minds first. And that's mainly what the New Age has been very, very successful in doing. A New Ager is like someone standing on the tracks of a train, and the train is coming up behind them, and they don't want to even turn around and look at it. They don't want to see it. They don't want the bad news. And they'll tell you that I don't want to know. That's negative. Well, here's the other part of the bad news. You see, if you don't look at what's negative, then you're losing your survival capabilities. That's why you have these capabilities. The little warnings that go off in your mind are for self-preservation. And you're out there running if you can't look around and see that train coming up behind you. So you've been neutralized by a very effective method. And also we find that MI5 and 6 have been behind it. Also, in creating these myths for the public... Who would have thought that your spy agencies were involved so heavily in the creation of essentially new religions and, and mass movements and leading them to? Because old Aleister Crowley, uh, we find out later, and declassified documentation, the man who was set out back in the 20s, right through the, the, the 30s and 40s, etc., this man started up the OTO, the Ordo Templi Orientis, a branch of Freemasonry with 96 degrees, mainly to get the young, up-and-coming, budding artists that would be led, that would be leading the sheep again, the people, in the near future. And sure enough, in the in the pop, rock, and uh, entertainment world, that was her hero, Alastair Crowley, and the OTO. So many people at the top were members of that. You you did stagger the imagination how they all fell for it. But Crowley was actually trained and put out by 
MI6, in fact. He even was a spy in Germany for them for a while. So that's once again, even your secret services are involved in the creation of modern mythologies. So I always caution people to beware and use their own judgment and don't follow anybody, including me. Check everything I say out for yourselves and don't take anything for granted. And I try to stick to the documentation that the big boys themselves have published. Books about the big boys are often slanted in so many different ways, depending upon the author's intent, that it can be very misleading. And you don't have to read about them by other people. Read the books that they put out themselves. Read all the books you can get by Lord Bertrand Russell. And you'll find in the foundations, once again, they set up foundations. There's even H.G. Wells Foundation, another propagandist for this particular elite. You'll find there are books there for $500 and, and more. Those are the ones they obviously don't want the public to get. The other ones you can get for maybe $40 or under. But the other ones, the ones where they spoke to their own peer group, their equals, generally are priced out of the range of most people. But look into Bertrand Russell's books, for instance. He, he certainly was a, a proponent for this new world order where the inferior gene types, all the useless eaters, as he called them himself, should simply be eliminated because to bring them all into a new world order would help us maybe bring down that new world order during its birth pangs. It's an odd philosophy because if you look at the philosophy of Hinduism, it's the same. It's the same philosophy. Because in Hinduism, and here's Darwin's whole theory, you start off really as sort of slime and you move from there as amoebas and just go up the ladder through evolution. And you compare that to Darwinists, Darwin's theory, which he didn't write himself because his grandpa had put it out before him, but it flopped. And he made uh, Darwin a superstar by a build-up in the media. And his book was a bestseller before he even hit the shelves. That's how you create a star. It's no different today. So he rehashed his grandpa's writings, which was just the inner beliefs of an upper elite who already ruled Britain and other parts of the world. Today, they simply call them junk genes. Now, junk genes being the commoners. And they actually set up eugenics societies. Now, the Rockefeller Foundation in the United States started up the American Eugenics Society, and they published their own magazine every month with pictures of these lovely white people with lovely teeth and, and uh, nice and tall and all the rest of it, nice families who were the perfect specimens of the superior type of breeding. And that's how blatant they were not so long ago. Now, they were also the guys behind the funding, the Rockefeller and others of IG Farben that set up the Nazi industry in World War, for World War II for Germany. And that's where they also got it. Adolf Hitler got all his ideas from Darwin in genetics, basically, and superior types and inferior types. He also was a great believer in Blavatsky. He read his, uh, her books. And you find that Lenin was no different. The Soviet system, playing with the Soviet side, which was international socialism, supposedly, versus national socialism, uh, also believed in superior types and inferior types. Trotsky more so uh, than Stalin or Lenin. And Trotsky came out with the idea of perpetual revolution. That's why he had to flee the Soviet system. He wanted the revolution to go on to the next step and the next step in the belief that they could speed up the process of evolution scientifically and kill off the inferior types at the same time, generation by generation, eliminate them. These are the people in the history books. The people today still follow. They still follow their beliefs. And if you look into the guy who trained uh, your various leaders in the U.S., um, like Rumsfeld, you'll find that it goes back to a particular professor that was sent over from Nazi Germany who also was a Nazi but also believed in the Trotsky um, idea of perpetual revolution to evolve man through man-made impetus, speed up the process, and bring them to this final Superman. And here we are going through it now today, folks. 